Hernandez and I'm a co-president of Alana here at the school. I'm a master's degree student. I'm also a member of Comunidad Latina, which is a Latino student organization. I was interested in what you said about theory and reality. The, the, the theory that you have is that this test kind of addressed people equally across the board without considering uh, their cultural backgrounds. And I'm wondering if you could speak about the test and how they addressed these different backgrounds. Did everybody have the same socioeconomic background? I'd like you to speak about that. You've raised a very good point. And obviously, Latino students, for example, in California tend to be disproportionately overrepresented as being from poor families or poorly educated families, immigrant families. And for example, in Oceanside and in Vista, the students, the immigrant students in both those districts tend to come from poor farm worker families. So they certainly have a lot of cultural and educational disadvantages. And that's why the fact that one district students did so well after the initiative passed and they got rid of bilingual education, and the other district that had exactly the same sort of immigrant students, their students did so much less well, I think is a sign that you have an interesting comparison. The tests basically involve reading, mathematics, subjects like that, and I think most of the parents are much happier when the students double their test scores on the test than if they don't do well, and that's why they're happy about the initiative. And on this side, in the front here, You've raised a very, very good point. And actually, that's, no, seriously. Our initiative makes a clear distinction between older students and younger students. In other words, students who are 10 years and older would have a much easier time getting a waiver to be placed or kept in a bilingual program as opposed to English immersion. Now, again, the theorists who believe in bilingual education and development actually think that the older you are, the easier it is to learn another language. So they would say older students would have an easier time in English immersion than younger students, but I think that's nonsense. The point about it is that under our initiative, we make that distinction. And now, you know, I'd like to say, I actually have talked with a lot of immigrants. I, I know a lot of immigrants. I work with them. I know a lot of them. I've actually asked them their opinion about English immersion, even for older students, because many of them arrived in the United States when they were 12 or 13. Most of them seem to believe that even at that age, it's better to be intensively taught English than to be taught academic subjects in your native language while you're learning English. So my uh, division of opinion on that, but I do believe at least you can make a case in favor of bilingual education for older students, where I think there's no case in the world, no logical case in the world, as to why you don't teach a five-year-old immigrant child English immediately once they start kindergarten. And that is the key issue involved. One, one follow-on point, which really is an important... I do want you to okay. keep your answers brief, too, because we sure. don't have... A There's one very left. important statistic I should give you. Over half of all the... Over half of all the immigrants... No, it really is important. Over half of all the... Over half of all the immigrant students in the United States who are classified as not knowing English were actually born in America. Most of the remainder came here when they were very young. So the vast, vast majority of so-called limited English students actually started school in the United States when they were five or six years old. There were relatively few who came here at 12 or 13. The reason that they don't know English when they're 12 or 13 is many times that they've been in these Spanish almost only classes for six or seven years, and that's the problem. Professor Snow? What am I answering here? <laughs> well, I mean, there is a school of thought that says younger students oh, younger generally... Younger versus older. All right. Well, I happen... I, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to... Um, have to admit here that I've actually collected data on speed of language acquisition among older and younger uh, second language learners. I mean, like testing the kids, going and see them every six weeks and figuring out how much they learned in the six-week intervals. And my data are pretty clear that 12-year-olds are much faster language learners than five-year-olds. So although you might ridicule this perspective, uh, I can't abandon it because it's not a theory. It's actually based on hard data. So my sense is that um, older learners can, in fact, acquire a second language quickly enough in an immersion setting. And I think if you're giving waivers easily, you should give the waivers for the children under 10, not over 10. And no, no, I, oh, sure. we're, what we're going to do is go around one more time, because we're, we're almost out of time. And each, each of our panelists will be giving 
a summary statement. I, so this gentleman here. Yeah, uh, I wonder, uh, you are saying that for the past 30 years, while in your program, has been a failure in the United States. So let's put the larger picture. Uh, recent uh, study, American students have failed all the national in other subject areas like math and science. So are you advocating again that we should get rid of all of the math program and the science program in the United States? The problem is not so much that some bilingual programs have failed, but no bilingual program has ever succeeded in the entire United States on a large scale. And if you have a 100% failure rate, I think the thing really is a failure. We disagree on that claim. I'm sorry. I have a, I Would this gentleman here? Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm not a bilingual educator. I'm not an educator. I'm a journalist who does social policy. You should love me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to take this from the social policy angle and talk about politics. And my definition of politics is two questions with four words. Who benefits? Who decides? Now, most of the social policy, education policy in this country over the past 30 years has been based on the assumption of a deficit model when it came to urban, urban education. And unfortunately, the funding tended to match that deficit approach, which is there wasn't much funding. Now, taking the data that you put out in terms of the failure rate for bilingual ed, you know, the question for me is trying to dig below that surface, what factors are relevant to look at that? Now, there's a number of factors, including funding, program size, and all that that we can go into, but I want to kind of jump really quickly to an analogy that I think you'll like as a theoretical physics. Suppose Einstein, during his time in trying to prove that nuclear fission works, tried to get fission by striking two pieces of pitchblende together for a spark. I don't think he'd wind up with fission, and I suspect that the way that you're interpreting data is pretty much the same. You're striking <coughs> two programs together, hoping for a spark, and there's not a spark. It's not how it works. Well, to the extent that you were talking about who benefits from these programs, that really raises a very important issue which I should respond to. We have what might be called the bilingual education industry in the United States. In other words, you have the bilingual teachers and the bilingual administrators, the bilingual academics, the bilingual textbook manufacturers, the bilingual coordinators. They benefit from bilingual education, whether it works or it doesn't work. They are the mobilized group that keeps this program in place even though it doesn't work. Another example of somebody who benefits, we were outspent again 25 to 1 in advertising in California. The reason we were outspent is one individual made the largest political contribution in the history of California, millions of dollars to oppose our initiative campaign. That individual is not Hispanic. He's a Republican billionaire. He doesn't even speak Spanish. And his connection to the issue is that he owns Cal America's largest Spanish language television network. Now, one could argue that if children learn English in school, they'll watch more English TV and less Spanish TV. If his ratings fall by one point, he loses hundreds of millions of dollars of personal net worth. He's a billionaire. And so po possibly that's the reason he spent millions of dollars to defeat an initiative that would have taught English to children. Maybe that's the connection. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to get someone from over here.